long-winded introduction. Uh, the only part I would uh, disagree with you, I'm not on it, the guys will, will do something. I've got two mics today, so I don't know why. Uh, Kiddington, as I was you know, getting ready to come up, Kiddington gave me another mic. So, yeah. My pack. Is it on? Yeah. Do I wait or do I keep going until? Okay, great. Guys, you know, like my hands are maybe 50% of my preaching. So if I have a handheld mic, a quarter of the anointing departs. Okay, so I hope we won't need it. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Oh, all right, it's fine. Is it on? Am I on? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, without further ado, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 18, long passage alert. That's where we're taking our message from. Um, so I'm just going to start reading because it's a long passage. And we've lost about five minutes. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves know... Uh, our letter of recommendation, sorry, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not see or might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And today, I'm not going to go through the whole passage because this passage is very difficult to break up because everything is flowing, you know. So if you start in verse 7, it just starts with now. If the minister, oh, okay, I need to give context because it starts with now. And then you want to break off at 12. It says, since we have such a hope, oh, come on. <laughs> Give me a break. So I read the whole thing. But my focus is on the last verse. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And the title of my message is taken from that verse, which is simply beholding the glory of the Lord. Now, in the past few weeks, we have heard uh, a few messages on uh, renewing our minds. I think Sekiwa started us off on that path three weeks ago, and then Rob kind of carried that through. And the idea was that we are to be transformed as Christians through the renewing of our minds. And they served us so well. And today I'm going to continue on that path, but from a different perspective. Uh, and we were taught about how we need to change how we think. This morning, I want to challenge us on changing what it is that we see, what it is that we look upon, and how often we do it. Now, as I was preparing this message, I started to think to myself, uh, how would I introduce the message? 
ah, it's a bit difficult. Okay, okay, okay. You know how it is. I, if, you're, if, if you've ever you know, done the preaching, you know what I'm talking about. And I thought to ask all of us a question which I asked myself and I found difficult to answer. What is the whole point of Christianity? What is the reason that you and I have been born again? What is the crux of the issue? We know that we are born again, we're saved, not because of our own works, we know it as grace, but what was this grace deployed to do? Why have I been invited into his kingdom? And I know it is a multifaceted question, but my interest was, what is the most important reason? What's the most important thing? And you know, Jesus was asked once what the greatest commandment was. And you'd have thought, come on, every word that comes from God is important. No need to talk about the greatest. But he had a response, right? He had a response for what the greatest commandment is. And so I think we can have a response for what is the most important thing about the reason that we are called of God. And I'm going to talk about this transformation, but I, I promise you it will be incidental to the rest of what I want to say. And I will explain as I go on why I'm taking this, this road. So the first place we're going to start uh, in answering this question is Mark chapter 3, verse 13. And I think the team has it. There we are. So this is Jesus. If you read that in Luke chapter 6, this is after he had prayed the whole night. And by this time, he had a crowd of disciples, people who were following him because of the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he was performing. And now he was going to choose an elite team, a crack team, if you like, men that he was going to designate as apostles. And so he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Perhaps I gave, <laughs> it actually goes on. Let me just read that. No, so it's not the media's team fault, it's mine. <laughs> I gave them just uh, the one verse. So I just, I will read it from here. Okay, so there we go. 3.13. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, right? This is verse 14. Verse 14, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Right? So these are the first Christians, prototype Christians. No one's a Christian before Christ dies, okay? But these are the prototype Christians. And it says that he called these 12, named them apostles, which is from the Greek apostolos, which means to be sent, right? That they might be with him. And he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons, and this morning, I want to put it to you that the first and the greatest part of the call of the Lord to each and every one of us is to simply be with him. That they might be with him to be wherever he was going, to share with him in all the experiences, trials, joys, tribulations, just to be with him. That's it. That's the first thing and the most important thing. And it is distinguished. And I believe that as the Spirit of God was, was inspiring Mark, right, to write these things, there is order to it. Be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. But when you look at the sermons we listen to, you look at the sermons that I've been listening to, I don't know about you, but most of the stuff I'm listening to and watching has to do with the things that come after the first thing. It has to do with how can I get more authority to fight anti-marriage spirits and spiritual husbands and spiritual wives and people whose money is stuck in the spirits. How do we get more power and authority to deal with those things? How do we pray for migraines so that those migraines, four, four weeks later or however long later, we have testimonies that they've been completely healed. This is what we're concerned about. How do I grow in authority? How do I preach this gospel so that people come in their thousands. And not many of us would want to read or listen to messages that talk about being with him. And I was saying to the Lord as I was preparing this message, I said, Lord, I think you are the one who has the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Me and the Lord, yeah, we are like that. <laughs> so don't try this at home. 
<laughs> I would recommend it. Okay. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, see, the, the issue is you are with us all the time, right? You have fulfilled your promise that you're going to be with us forever. Okay. And so when you say to someone to be with the Lord, it's like, okay, but he's already with me. Right? And so I think it would have been better if you did that Old Testament thing where you go and you come and you go and you come. And then you have to say, Lord, please come. Lord, it's been a week. It's been three weeks. You know, maybe we would value your presence more. Right? And this is just me thinking about that. And as I was talking to the Lord about it, he didn't say anything back to me. Thoughts came to my mind. I thought about a man called Samson. And how... There's that moment when his hair was cut off. And Delilah said to him, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he got out of bed and said, I'm going to go out and do exactly what I've been doing before. And then one of the most tragic verses in the Bible, he says, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. So what it means is when, when, when Samson woke up, right, no more hair. He felt exactly the same as when he slept and he still had his hair, and the Lord was with him. There was no difference for Samson anymore between the Lord being with him and the Lord having departed. He could no longer tell because the presence of God had become familiar to him. And I wondered to myself, if God was to heed <laughs> my thoughts and take them into account, and say, okay, Shingai, I love my people. I want to be with them all the time, but I'm going to take three weeks off. And I wonder, when we come on a Sunday and we're praying outside, <clears throat> the prayer is done, we come in, we do our worship for 40 minutes. We have the hilarious notices. <laughs> the troublesome teens are prayed out. <laughs> Shingai comes to share the message, or whoever else. And then we have tea, coffee, for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on those of us who maybe would like to close all the gates after everyone's gone. And the Lord had withdrawn his presence. Would we be like Samson? I will go out as I had done before. Would we be like Samson waking up in the morning, going for a presentation, uh, you know, to, to a board of trustees or board, and just standing up there, and the Lord is not with you, and it makes no difference. Thank God we'll never have to know. Because he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. But it got me thinking. How valuable is his presence to us? How important is it that we are with him? You know, Jesus, being fully man and fully God, in his greatest moment of anguish, praying that the cup would be taken away, had taken three of his guys to be with him. And he comes back and finds them sleeping. And says, could you not just wait with me for an hour? You hear the anguish in his voice. He wants to be with us. It is something that he desires. It is the firstness of everything in our calling. Before you're a preacher, before you're a prophet, before you're an apostle, before you're anything, a great businessman making a lot of money, you are called to be with him. And he wants to spend time with us. And Martha found this out the hard way. She came to Jesus and said, my sister's just sitting around doing nothing. She's so lazy. Tell her to help me. You know how it is, like siblings. Sometimes you just need to go to someone else because they don't listen to you. <laughs> Even though you're the older sibling. You need someone to step in. And Jesus said to her, Martha, you're troubled about many things. Worried about so many things. Yet only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the one thing and it will not be taken from her. He doesn't even say what the one thing is. He says there's just one thing that's necessary. You deduce from the context what the one thing was, because she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him, spending time with him. And he said, that's never going to be taken away from her. And what's interesting is that when the Lord uh, died as the scriptures had said he would, 
everybody else wanted to prepare his body for burial. All the other ladies, and they showed up at the tomb, but they were too late. Mary was the one who Jesus said, she has prepared me for my burial beforehand, because he knew they would not have a chance to prepare his body, to be with him. We're going to talk about transformation. Don't worry, don't worry, just... <laughs> this is a slow burner today, okay? And then we see Jesus in his desire. So we just want to just lay the foundation and see the heart of the Lord. In John 17, verses 20 to 24, this is when he's praying, right? He prays first for himself before he's going to the cross. He prays for himself first. Then he prays for his disciples. And then here in verse 20, he starts to pray for all of us. He says, I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. And I need the guys to, yeah, thank you so much. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they, may also, also, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, and that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Verse 24 is the kicker. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. For what purpose? To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Listen to that prayer. He's praying. This is his prayer. When a man is about to die, he prays for the most important things. And for him, he has to pray and ask the Father that they may be with him so that they may behold his glory. Jesus is interested in us seeing him high and lifted up as we sing in that song. But you see, <laughs> if you were maybe playing uh, the atheist game, this sounds like you know, if someone said, if your husband came to and said, you know, my wife, <laughs> my greatest desire is that you may see me in all my pomp, <laughs> in all my greatness. This is my greatest desire for you. What would you say to your husband? You start praying. <laughs> Preferably in tongues. Lord, deliver this man from such narcissism, from such self-love. But when the Lord says, I want them to see my glory. You see, when you look at the passage that uh, Rob shared from, Romans chapter 1, you talked about that uh, depravity of mankind. But if you look at where it began, it says, they do not honor or glorify God even though they knew he existed. Right? So that's how it started. It started with them turning their eyes away from his glory and they became depraved as a result. So for when the Lord says, I want them to see my glory, it's not so, you see, because this is Jesus, right? This is the Jesus of which, of, of, of which the scripture says, uh, knowing that the Father had placed all things in his hands and that he was going to the Father, he put on a towel around his waist and started to wash their feet. This is not a person who is insecure. There's not a person who needs people to pat him on the back all the time. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're so wonderful. Have you ever been around people like that? It's exhausting. They always need to be praised. You always need to be saying nice things about them just to remain on their good side, even if they're doing crazy stuff. It's a terrible existence. But the Lord is not like that. Because he knows that when we behold his glory, it is for our good. Because there are things that happen when we begin to behold the glory of the Lord. And once again, it's a slow burner. We're going to talk about it later. So we're setting the foundation. What does Jesus really want? This is his desire. We've established it in two passages. And here's the last one. John 14, verse 21. The person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
I will reveal myself to him. So your, your translation might say, I'll manifest myself to him. If we could add the rest of that verse in the Amplified, I chose for the Amplified because it has that uh, you know, extended uh, explanation. But while that is coming up, the word used there for manifest is the word emphanizo. So some Greek uh, lessons for you now. Right? And this word speaks of manifestation to the sight. Right? And is opposed to the Greek word delo, which is making something evident to the mind. So this is a manifestation to the sight, a clear and conspicuous manifestation where you see there is Jesus right there. This is what he says. This is a promise, right? He says, those who keep my commandments are the ones who demonstrate love for me. And these people will be loved by my father, right? There's the consequence or the reward, however you want to see it. They'll be loved by my father, right? Not only will they be loved by my father, I will love them and I will show myself to them. Plainly. So, unfortunately, we don't have the rest. I don't know if that's been cut because of the screen or I don't know. But it would have been great to see what it says there of that word because it is actually then uh, brought out. So if you have your Amplified, you can open it or you can read it later. But it talks about a clear and an open manifestation where Jesus doesn't want us to have a faith based on philosophical arguments. You see, because the problem with having a faith based on philosophical arguments or arguments about how this is all by intelligent design, there's no way that this could have been just by a bowl of soup that ignited the Big Bang and then everything existed. See, the problem with arguments is someone can bring a superior argument or even an inferior argument, but just better presented. And then you begin to shake. I remember I was driving that at the time and I just thought to myself, this thought crossed my mind and it scared me <laughs> because <laughs> I was just like, oh my goodness, what's happening? I just started to think to myself as I was driving, I thought, what if the Lord is not real? What if this is all, <laughs> this is not, you know, <laughs> what if he doesn't really exist? It's just a figment of our minds and we're doing all this stuff. What if? <laughs> Amen, my brother. <laughs> I, it, was, it, was, it was something else. But you know, <clears throat> one thing you'll find with people who maybe believed in the Lord and turned away, the question you have to ask is whether they experienced this Lord. So, there is no way that I can deny Farai. He's right here. I have talked to him. I have eaten with him. I have made fun of him when his team has lost. <laughs> he is very real to me. But if Farai is someone I've only known through pictures, or maybe some of his videos from when he was preaching on YouTube, someone can argue, you know, well, that is AI. That's not a real person. I don't know if you've seen some uh, AI, uh, some, yeah, it's scary, hey? It looks so real. So, no, 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 that fire doesn't exist. It's just uh, Derek did something and he played around some graphics. <laughs> I thought fire doesn't exist. And somewhere along the way, you could actually convince me. Yes. Yes. But not when You've met I've Come met on. him. Come on. I've spent time with him. Yeah. You tell me he doesn't exist, he's not real. I'll say, I spoke to him this morning. morning. Yeah. Come That's on. good. Yes. That's true. Yeah. I know where he is now. Let's go. I'll show you where he is. So the Lord wants us to be confident because we, has, we have had this experience with him. He is real to us. He's not something that we just read in stories or heard from someone's experience. He has come and shown himself. He said, if you love me, I will show myself to you. And it's a promise. And I ask myself, you know, the, the Bible says the promises of God are yes and amen. And when we think about those promises, most of the time, we are thinking about promise to get married. Come on. The promise, you know, <laughs> that God, receive it. Take it. <laughs> promise of wealth, promise of promotion, being lifted up. And I'm not saying that's wrong because God wants to do all of that. But I'm inviting you to another promise. There's another promise, guys. He says, if you love me, I will love you and I will show myself to you. 
I remember I was reading this, uh, sitting on my mom's veranda in 2008. And uh, there was no electricity, and you know Zim, how Zim was in 2008. Okay. And I came to that verse, and I read it, and I began to cry. I'm not a person who likes to cry. People who know me very well <coughs> tell you I'm not a person who enjoys it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> God has delivered me from that. <laughs> Praise God. But I broke down because it wasn't something that was uh, voluntary. It was an involuntary reaction. And I remember reading that and I couldn't get away from that verse where he keeps talking about how he wants to show himself. He wants to manifest himself. He wants me to know him as he himself is truly known. You know, he himself said to the Pharisees about the father, says you never heard his voice and you've never seen his form. Distinguishing their ministry from his. I've heard his voice and I've seen his form. And as I was weeping, and every time these days, when I think about the Lord showing himself to me, I have tears in my eyes. And I, I, it just happens. And these days, I've tried not to tell people because now, you know, people think a certain way. When you start talking about, I want to be with the Lord, you know. In Shona, they say, or something like that, right? I remember one time I was playing a song. Um... Jerusalem, you know, Mshawangu ETC. And my mom heard me playing that song. And she berated me. <laughs> Why are you playing that song? Because <laughs> it's the kind of song we play at funerals. Yeah. Right? So maybe God wants to take my son or something. You know, they're worried. Because before my father passed on, he went to the graves and did whatever he did at the graves. He went to go and talk to some sister of his. So it was like, you know, when that kind of thing happens, you're like, oh, 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 oh. Uh oh, what's happening? So I've stopped telling people, but this is the desire of my heart. I want to see him. I desire to see him. It's not something I'm waiting for uh, when the trumpet sounds and we go. Because this promise is for today. If you look at verse 23, it says, and then we will make our home with him, right? Which he has done. If you're a Christian, you have the Lord living in you. So he's not going to make his home with us in the sweet by and by. He has done it now. So I'm believing that he will manifest himself to me. From time to time, he is kind enough to do so. Sometimes in the most inconvenient ways. <laughs> Remember one time I was driving <clears throat> and um, <laughs> I was 40 meters or so from a traffic light. And I just felt the presence of God in the car. And I wondered to myself, Lord, do you want... Do you want me to crash? What's going to, you know, I don't know why you're doing this. I wasn't thinking about God at all. I was thinking about my list, the things I'm not done when I get to, to work. There's this and that. And, and, and there's just feeling the presence of God in the car. And you know, sometimes because you're, it's, it's the law-based thinking is very hard to get out of your head. You're thinking, what did I do? Did I pray today? Did I, you know, like, like you're saying. You feel like you're so far away. But then he shows up because he just loves to spend time with his people. Not because we are wonderful people. May the Lord help me. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> Not because we're great people, but because he's a good God. Praise you, Jesus. So we have established this as a foundation. Okay? There's time. Oh, yes. Still have time. <laughs> Because, you see, before we talk about beholding the glory, we have to be careful that we do not go in the direction of the law in Moses' ministry. As you saw Paul talking about that ministry no longer having glory and how we can be legalistic and give you five steps to beholding the glory. We have to establish that before we even start, the Lord has made the way. We're no longer those who are seeking the face of God. I know, I know people say that. I know what they mean by that. But you see, if you look at the Bible very closely, that is a phrase from the old covenant. A covenant when the Lord was hiding behind a curtain and could only be visited once a year by a very holy person 
who turned out not to be so holy as the generations went on. But now we don't seek his face. Why? Because when, when the God-man died on the cross, the Bible says the curtain was torn from top to bottom. In other words, God checked out of the temple. He's no longer hiding. Anyone who wants to come, whether you're a morning person, you're a night owl, you believe in it, 12, 12 a.m., guys, if you don't pray at 12 a.m., you know, it's DJ, you're doing nothing. If I five in the morning person, it's, I'm here. I've made the way open. We no longer need to seek his face. We are not like Moses. Moses said, I want to see your glory. And God said, well, okay, Moses, I hear you, but if I show you my face, you will die. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in a rock. I'm going to put my hand over you. I'm going to declare my name, the Lord, the Lord, and I'm going to pass by. And while my hand on the rock, I'm going to keep going and going, and you can see my back as I go into the distance. And that is the old covenant, the covenant of distance, the covenant of God leaving, the covenant of God in the distance. And all day is, he was here. No, no, he's further away, a receding glory. That's as good as it got for Moses. But now, he says face to face, let's meet. Let's have that time. I've removed the barrier. I have died. I have paid the price. Now you are mine and I am yours. Let's do this thing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, we're going to talk about Moses' experience. And I want to separate Moses' experience from his ministry. It was a receding glory, but Exodus chapter 34 verse 29 is very interesting and instructive. There's a good risk manager. I'm going, okay, I don't need to do that. <laughs> because the guys have been brilliant at the back today. Please, guys, just a round of applause for them. They've been very good. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. And I asked for the KJV because I like that word, wist. You know, he wist not. So if you're struggling with that, it's he did not know, okay? That's what your translation will say. But he wist not that the skin of his face was shining. Now, even though Moses had this message and this uh, glory that was fading, his experience is instructive to us. Because when you look at that phrase that says that he wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him, or because he had been talking to God, that's another translation. It's an interesting verse that you can interpret in two ways, or you can read in two ways. The first reading is his face was shining. Why was his face shining? Because he was talking to God. Right? And then the second way you can read it is, he did not know that his face was shining. Why did he not know that his face was shining? Because he was talking to the Lord. So the first one is talking about the result of the uh, experience or the relationship or the encounter he was having. The second is talking to how he became unaware of himself. He lost all awareness of self. He was not aware that his face was shining. He needed people to tell him. Now, guys, I don't know about you. You're coming down from a mountain. It's not like there's street lights or anything, and your face is shining. Surely you should be able to see that the ground in front of you. <laughs> there's light. <laughs> and to think, where's this light coming from? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Maybe I'm too much of a 21st century guy. <laughs> but you know, that's the kind of, like, dude, can't you see that you, you're walking down this, and it's dark and now this, there's illumination. But Moses was so engrossed in God that he lost all awareness of himself. He lost all consciousness of who he is and became so conscious of God. And this is what happens when we spend time with the Lord and we behold him, is that the consciousness that we have, the self-consciousness is displaced by a Christ consciousness. Wow. And the importance of consciousness, if you read that in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is remonstrating with the Corinthians, he says to them, stop sinning. And he says to them, come out of your drunken stupor and stop sinning as you ought. Sinning, so when we talk about drunkenness, drunkenness is a state of altered consciousness, Right? 
So when you're in sin, you're in a state of altered consciousness. And he's saying, sober up, come to the right consciousness, which is the consciousness of Christ, and then you will stop sinning. So when we become conscious of him, when we lose all sight of ourselves, he becomes real and what he is comes to us. Moses had to be told, hey, 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 hey. stay there. And they ran away from him. And he said that he had to call them back. Hey, guys, it's just it's me. Oh, good old Moses. Come, guys, come back. So he had to wear a veil all the time. Because people were worried. People were afraid. This is what happens when we behold the Lord. This is what happens when we spend time with the Lord and he begins to change us. Maybe I need to share, you know, the Bible says that those who practice and teach these things will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So I want my greatness. Okay, guys. <laughs> so let me tell you about my practice. Okay. But this is not something recent. So please don't think that, you know, but it's still valid. So some years ago, um, God laid on my heart the importance of no agenda times, even in prayer. Because I was the kind of guy who'd rush in with a list. No, 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 let's just spend time. And so I had a playlist of worship songs that I would sing because I didn't have a radio. Right? And during that time, I would worship maybe first up because it was very, it's a weird thing. You know, it's easier to worship when there's everybody here and then the guys are strumming away and, you know, uh, Mr. Fombe there is doing something with the riffs and, you know, like, oh, <laughs> that's, that's nice. <laughs> you know? But when you're on your own, okay, <laughs> without a radio, you feel weird. <clears throat> okay. But I got the hang of it. And what I realized was, over time, I'll be worshiping God, and then there would come a moment where I will no longer be able to sing. And the atmosphere would absolutely change. And sometimes I would not be able to continue standing because I'd feel a weight on my shoulders and it would bring me to my knees and I'll be there in the presence of God and it will be this, the kind of stillness that I cannot describe. Stillness in his presence. But in those days, because I belong to a church where hearing the voice of God was a big thing, all I was thinking about was now God is going to talk to me. And I was focused on hearing him. And yet he did not say a thing. He would be quiet. And I'm thinking, okay, let me just wait a bit longer, a little longer. Okay, today didn't happen. Let's do it again tomorrow. And it became a, a thing where it wasn't anymore about should I, should I worship for an hour? Should I worship for 45 minutes? Is it 15 minutes? It was worship until you get to that point. And day after day, it was like that. I'm trying to hear his voice. Why won't he speak? I'm trying to see a vision. And because, you know, when I go to church, I want to also stand up and say, you know, the Lord said to me, you know. <laughs> you won't believe what God showed me. <laughs> Nothing. And I, it went on for months. But there's something, you know, and it's not like, like, you know, big ticket things like addictions or whatever. The thing that I noticed that was so weird was, at that time I was studying for my exams, so I could sit, right, and the desk is totally like chaotic, all sorts of magazines or whatever, and I was comfortable, right? But then I realized at some point that I sat down and I thought to myself, wait a minute, this table is so untidy. Ah, whatever. And as I continued, I came to a point where I would not be able to study if the desk was untidy. And I was like, this is weird. And being a guy, of course, one of the other things, a proper guy. <laughs> was not married. Didn't have kids. Oh, didn't have kids. <laughs> Um, personal grooming is an option. <laughs> guys, don't say amen. Especially the married guys. Just look down. Don't even look at me. I'll take the hit. 
for the whole team. Okay. Let me absorb it. Optional. Don't be about today. Oh, well, I well, <laughs> didn't feel like it. But I'm telling you, one of the things that struck me was how I just couldn't go through the day. I think, but I haven't bought today. I haven't bought today. Ah, but I haven't bought. So what? Why am I so worried about this? Okay, that's weird as well. Then, you know, I love uh, movies with some action. And I used to love watching boxing. And I could watch UFC, mixed martial arts. But then I realized that I could no longer watch this stuff anymore. You know, because I just felt like, woo, that was so violent. That, woo, hey. <laughs> And I was like, Shinky, are you getting soft? <laughs> Until the Lord had to say, these are the changes that are happening. Yeah. Yeah. And some of those changes, I have them to this day. Struggle. Sometimes you just do it because you're tired, but you're struggling. Everything's untidy. I'm just too tired. To do. I just knew I've got things to do, but I'm just not settled. And I realized, I started to remember how the Bible says that God is a God of order. How when the earth, he created the earth, the first thing he did was create order. There was chaos. And then you find that the more you spend time with God, the more you start learning about who God is by how he reveals himself in you. Amen. So God really doesn't like violence. He's a God of peace. I would have read it. But it's different when you see it changing you and thinking, oh, I'm becoming more like God. So God really doesn't like this thing. Come on, man. That thing about cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the Bible. <laughs> but here I am. I'm living it out. I am experiencing this desire to burn. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, men, as I said, men look down. <laughs> But it's a, it's a struggle. <laughs> you really, that's when you know that the Lord is changing you. <laughs> when you can do that. <laughs> Praise God. And you begin to see those changes, right? But all this time, the thing that I was so worried, the thing that I really wanted to hear his voice wasn't happening. But because I was in his presence all the time, he was changing me. And I wished not. <laughs> 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 I think I'm going to use that in an email. <laughs> I wish not that the appointment was a 10. <laughs> My apologies. You don't have to read the Bible. Yeah. You know, and so this is what happens when we spend time with the Lord. When you behold his glory, he's changing us on the inside. He's changing us and making us more like himself. Mm. And there's a verse that I want to share. I hope because I've laid the foundation of the grace of God, if you read this verse uh, in an old covenant way, it will condemn you like it did me many years. But it has liberated me in the past few years. First John chapter 3, verse 6. I think I've skipped something. I will come back to it. It says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. So it was, I would feel condemned because I'm sinning. So do you mean I've never seen you, Lord? I've never, oh God, I've never known this God because I've got sin in my life. But when I understood it from a new covenant perspective, right, that that verse, John is actually giving us a key. He is saying, you, if you keep on sinning, you've neither seen him nor known him because if you saw him and knew him, you would not continue to sin. Come on. And so the key is to see and to know. Yes. And the sin goes. Yes. I wish they would put this in some of these books, Conquering and Every Man's Battle, or whatever it is for you ladies. <laughs> whatever books about overcoming this or overcoming that. It's all these steps. But the greatest step is never told. See him, know him, and you will become like him. This is why he wants us to behold his glory, not because he needs our praise. He craves, oh my God, if you don't praise me, what's going to happen to me? Have you noticed when you haven't prayed and it's been weeks, you don't know where your Bible is, he's still God? 
But it is for our benefit. Because when we behold his glory, we are transformed. When we behold his glory, we are changed. And so I'll just share <clears throat> something. If you look at Moses, there's two things that will happen to you from the scriptures that you will see. John, um, let's go to Mark 9, verse 15, at the back there. So we, we remember, 9.15, is that in the Amplified? Yes, it is. Again, my bad. But that verse is Jesus coming down from the mountain, just like Moses came down from the mountain. And the Amplified says, uh, with his face and his features still glistening, this is from the Mount of Transfiguration. His face was still shining. What happened to Jesus is the opposite of what happened to Moses. With Moses, they were running away, put on a veil. When they saw him, the entire crowd, listen, the whole crowd, all the people that are in the base of the mountain, they were startled. Other translations say they were in awe. They were in wonder and began running up to greet him. Those are the results, guys. When you see, because the world that we're going to do not really want to see Shanghai or Rob or Keith. We need to show them Jesus. Because this happened to Jesus. Not to the disciples. There are three other guys coming around with him. Came down the mountain. But they saw Jesus. The more we are like Jesus, the more this sort of thing will happen. You just, people just want to be around you. You know, there's times when you wonder, why, 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 just leave me alone. <laughs> you know, I just want, <laughs> just want time to myself. People just want to be around you. It's not about you. Wow. Ran up to greet him as he came down and his face was shining. That's the glory that we have. But in the world that we live, we will have those two experiences. There will be people who will say, put a veil on your face. <clears throat> those of this world who are perishing, who don't want to be confronted with the ways of their lives, those who are compromised as Christians, please dim your shine. Where's Simon? Is he here? Stand up, Simon. There he is, being, pretending to be shy and everything. <laughs> this guy is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> On the status, even his jokes. Yeah. They're about Jesus. <laughs> They're about God. I'm like, bruh. And then it's like sometimes you'll have, sometimes, rarely, you'll have something that is remotely normal. <laughs> and I tell you something, that kind of thing is challenging. Yes. It makes you think to yourself, am I burning for God? Do I have zeal for the Lord? I want to say to you, do not dim yeah. your light. Yes. Don't put on a veil. Because we should boldly, unlike Moses, declare the glory. The glory that is on us. We should show it to the world. Thank you, Simon. So people will want to dim your light, but then there'll be others, people who come to you and say, oh, wow, wow, this message of salvation, what do I do? You know, people, you know, let me tell you this. The people that you think don't like your Christianity, they are like, some of them are like Nicodemus. They will come to you secretly. Mkoma yeah. Shinki. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mkoma. This is new. I could get used to this. You know, so sometimes we. We, 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 we dim our shine. We're not bold. We do not declare the glory that has been manifested in us. Why? Because we're afraid. We're worried about offending people. Meanwhile, they're thinking, this guy, I wish, I wish I was like this guy. That's how I got saved. A guy just shared his experience of hearing the voice of God. He said, today I was late and I knew the Lord told me because I was going to be punished and all this. This is high school. The Lord told you. <laughs> Scripture union, guys. And you know, I had read the Bible, and I was the kind of guy that everyone else would bring to an argument, just so that I could shut those guys down. Because I knew all the things that they could not answer. So whenever they had a, oh, no, no, let's call Shingi. Shingi would deal with you. And for sure, I would deal with them. So, I was one of those guys that had to do the Nicodemus thing. 
<laughs> Kom. <laughs> and I gave my life to Christ at four in the morning. Sometime in June in the year, I don't know, was it 2000 or something? And people made fun of me, but it was okay. But she's how it is. There was something in me that ached for, even though I made fun of them and I argued with them, but something in me was like, I wish I had what that guy had. Surely for God to tell you that today, if you're not going to wake up on time, you're going to be punished. And the guy doesn't wake up on time and he's punished. I'm like, hey, I wish I, wish I could have that. So know that in your mind. You're the person who has what they need, what they want what they're craving for. Because God has set eternity in the hearts of men and the testimony of himself. That's why Jesus said to Paul, it is hard for you to keep keep kicking against the goats. Right? Because there was something in him every time, even when you saw Stephen, all this time he was persecuting, but something in him was telling him, this is not how it's supposed to be done. There's something about these guys that I don't, there's something I need that they have. The people wanted to pay money for the thing that we trivialize. The guy just comes, these guys come from town, lay hands on these guys, and then start speaking in tongues. They're like, okay, um, can I pay you some money for that? I need that. I'm a magician, man. I do this thing, but this is the next level. So here's some money, some subscriptions. Because what we have is of eternal worth and the surpassing glory. Father, we thank you so much for this glorious opportunity that you've given by inviting us to yourself, to know you, to see you in all of your glory. We're so grateful. We know that we don't deserve it. We know that sometimes, like Samson, we have become familiar. We know that sometimes we we actually are ashamed of this glory. But Father, you still you're faithful and you love us. And I pray that you would place in us a desire that overcomes the desire for the things of this world. The time that we spend on all these other things, social media and even all the things where we bury ourselves in work just to have an excuse not to spend time with you. Lord, I pray that you would resurrect a hunger, reawaken a desire to know you above all things. That, Lord, even as times are difficult and things are hard, that it would never be an excuse for us, but that we would use everything around us as an occasion, as an opportunity to get to know you and to press in to you. Because this is the greatest reason you have called us. You have called us to relationship. You have called us to friendship. So, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Every person here today, wherever they may be, Lord, you know. You are not condemning us. You're not uh, finding fault with us. You are inviting us. And Lord, give us the grace to heed your invitation. Thank you, Lord Jesus.